Hi there, I'm the Mythkeeper. Welcome back to my channel. This week we're talking about the Fae. Now the Fae is a type of creature that I've touched on a bunch of times in my various videos. In my Irisen Deep Dive, for example, I talk about an entire city that's just populated by the Fae. They also pop up in various other regional deep dives. I've talked about the gnomes in my Ancestry Guide. I've also talked about the First World itself, the realm that all Fae creatures come from, in my Planar Cosmology Guides video. Uh, but today I'm talking about Fey creatures. I've picked eight different fey creatures. Obviously, this doesn't represent the gamut of fey kind. They're a very diverse creature type, but I've provided, I think, an interesting cross section. So I think you'll have a good time with this video. Also, while I'm here, I want to alert you all to my new Myth Watchers Club. I want to do a little promo. I think you can hit the join button somewhere around here. When you join, uh, it's $4.99 a month. You can get early access to videos. You get uh, access to four videos earlier than everybody else. And uh, you also get uh, special badges, uh, priority reply to comments, and a couple of other perks. Uh, so if you want to support the channel, uh, please go and join. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you, and enjoy the video. Fey creatures are any type of creature that originated in the first world, a fairy realm that was a sort of first draft of reality created by the gods and their Elohim servants in the Age of Creation. It is a wild and fickle place, a work never truly completed by the gods. The first world is also infinite in scope, of constant varying wilderness, with trees as tall as mountains, living bodies of water, and traveling fairy courts. It epitomizes the chaos of birth and fertility. Conditions vary dramatically from place to place. What could be considered to be laws of nature on the material plane are no more than local bylaws in the first world, and even those bylaws can be overturned, even unconsciously, by those with sufficient willpower. I go into the first world in much more detail than I can cover here in my Inner Plains Part 1 video, which I'll link in the description below. Regardless, all creatures originating in the first world are considered to be fey, and if you've watched any of my regional deep dive videos, especially the ones on the River Kingdoms, the Linorm Kingdoms, or on Irisin, you will see that fey are well represented in the world of Galarian, many having fled to the material world after a great calamity befell the first world sometime during the Age of Anguish. The people that came in the greatest numbers are the gnomes, who now appear in Galarian with such frequency that they think of themselves as a native people, and are considered a common player character race in the game. But many other fey creatures came through as well, and still more find their way to the material world with each passing year, due to discovering gaps in the veil, the boundary that protects the material world from the first world. In this video, I'm going to talk about eight of the most common types of fey creatures that can be found in Galarian, not including gnomes, as they are covered in my Small Folk Ancestry Guide, which I'll also link below. The fey creatures I'll be covering today are gremlins, norns, nymphs, redcaps, rusalkas, satyrs, sprites, and unicorns. Gremlins. Gremlins in the real world may have the most modern origin of all the mythical creatures I've covered to date. Though these troublesome pests likely have roots in ancient English folklore, they are most commonly associated with aircraft of the 20th century. Whenever an airplane experienced an unexplained malfunction, mechanics and pilots would attribute the issue to mischievous impish goblins that they referred to as gremlins. Since then, gremlins have been used as a scapegoat for various types of mechanical and electronic failures. Cementing the modern portrayal of the gremlins is Joe Dante's classic 1984 comedy Gremlins, in this movie, a small, fuzzy creature known as a mogwai accidentally produces clones of himself, which then transform into grotesque, scaly gremlins that wreak havoc through mischievous acts of sabotage. In Pathfinder, the term gremlin is a broad label, encompassing a range of vile, mischievous fae whose only goal is to cause chaos and torment other beings. These malevolent creatures lack souls and have no understanding of morality, thriving on destruction and deviance. Gremlins are widely despised by other fey, and numerous attempts have been made to eradicate them from existence. In the First World, ancient forces have nearly succeeded in driving them out entirely, although they may occasionally appear spontaneously. Unfortunately, these resilient creatures have adapted to life on the material plane, and haven't just survived there, they've thrived. Like cockroaches, they congregate in clusters in dark, unsanitary areas on the fringes of human settlements. Once they have established a foothold, they begin to reproduce asexually by budding. Although the specifics of the process vary from one species to another, it typically involves the growth of a hideous tumor on the body of a reproductive gremlin. Once the tumor has grown to about the size of the host, it detaches and forms a new gremlin. Galarian has long been plagued by them. Their populations quickly multiplied and evolved into various subspecies, with each one more vile than the last. The Fwath the Fwath are aquatic gremlins with lobster-like claws that congregate in colonies within sea caves and coral reefs near active shipping lanes or large ports. 
They have a deep hatred for land dwellers, especially those who violate their waters with ships and derive pleasure from dismantling vessels and drowning their crews. Due to their aversion to sunlight, they attack at night, consuming any evidence of their gruesome acts as they have insatiable taste for human flesh. After slaying a ship's crew, they loot the vessel for precious items, which they store in their undersea lairs. Once they have stripped the ship of its valuables, they set it adrift as a ghost ship to lure other vessels into their grasp, hiding until nightfall to ravage and kill. Flath infestations can quickly escalate, creating a cascade of problems as the wreckage from one victim attracts more ships and leads to an increasing number of wrecks. Flath are unique creatures with a combination of exoskeletons and endoskeletons. In some rare cases, they create new colonies beneath the ghost ships, constructing cage-shaped living areas with their victims' bones, eventually encrusted with barnacles and other shellfish. Grimples. The Grimples are an unsightly and putrid-looking creature, resembling a half-starved possum with leathery flaps of skin between its forearms and its stubby hind legs. Its face is dominated by a pair of boar-like tusks, and it hosts small parasites, making it a sickly-looking and hideously ugly creature that constantly sheds its skin. Grimples are known to be filthy urban scavengers that dwell in abandoned buildings, eaves, clock towers, belfries, and steeples. They are quick climbers and use the loose flaps of skin between their arms and legs to glide short distances. Grimples are voracious omnivores that thrive on garbage. They frequently scavenge inns, restaurants, and other places where they can find a steady supply of food. Like other gremlins, Grimples loathe humans and express their hatreds by attacking drunks, torturing guard dogs, unlocking stables, urinating in water barrels, and loosening hanging storefront signs to fall on people. Jinkins. Jinkins possess bat-like faces, toad-like skin, and spiky fangs arranged in rows, and they are emaciated. Due to their rubbery limbs, they can squeeze into remarkably tiny areas, and like other gremlins, they have acclimated to life on the material plane, requiring sleep and sustenance. Nonetheless, they sleep lightly, waking up effortlessly from their brief naps, and never sleeping for over an hour. They seem to consume food more for pleasure than necessity, devouring the meats of small rodents that inhabit their domain, as well as potentially larger humanoids such as goblins and zvirfnebli. Jinkins dwell in cavernous underground depths, contorting and skittering through the cramped passageways as they plot attacks on nearly any creature they encounter. They congregate in packs and prefer seizing territories that are riddled with tiny nooks and crevices, which they use both for concealment and protection. They prefer locations with intricate networks of tunnels, such as karst formations, glacial tears, and sewers, where they can create elaborate traps and snares, often baited with meat or treasure. Mites. Mites are a repulsive species of gremlin found in the Darklands. They are short and have blue, bruised-looking skin with bulging eyes, and are typically despised by all who share their domains, including goblins. Mites dwell in the darkest subterranean recesses, living among mindless vermin that are the only creatures able to tolerate them. Mites have a natural inclination towards insanity, and most suffer from memory loss, hallucinations, delusions of grandeur, and paranoia after only a few years of adulthood. They are relatively helpless as individuals and depend on their colonies for security. Although they keep to themselves, they are easy targets and are often bullied and abused by more powerful creatures of the Darklands. Mites can communicate with centipedes, spiders, ticks, and other mindless vermin. They secrete a chemical that attracts these creatures, which they have learned to direct using sounds and gestures. Mites so value these verminous companions, they sometimes use their dead as breeding farms for vermin colonies. Nuglubs. Nuglubs are the largest and most aggressive of the land-dwelling gremlins. They are hunched and hideous creatures with three eyes, and while they are subterranean creatures like mites, they prefer to lurk in areas where they can ambush larger prey. Nuglubs enjoy feeding on the flesh of humanoids and other intelligent creatures, particularly other nuglubs. As a result, they are usually solitary creatures, forming their own gangs by bullying lesser gremlins into servitude. These gangs consist of a single nuglub and six to eight lesser gremlins. Nuglub gangs actively hunt small and isolated humanoid settlements and leave no survivors. They start by laying traps in the surrounding area and wait until the moon is high before creeping into town. Once there, they bind everyone to their beds and torture and eat their victims alive. Afterwards, they loot the settlement, taking whatever items they desire, particularly gems, gold, jewelry, and magic items. Nuglubs love treasure and greedily store it away in secure trap-laden chests. Their treasure traps are often sadistic and designed to cause severe pain and disfigurement rather than outright death. Pugwampi. Pugwampis are known for their affinity for warm climates, especially deserts and other barren regions. They possess an unlucky aura and an unusual fondness for gnolls. Pugwampis typically avoid sunlight and take up residence in abandoned structures of larger creatures such as ruined fortresses, sewer tunnels, and ghost towns. The members of a colony are constantly bickering, with larger Pugwampis dominating the smaller ones. However, they usually gather together in tribes led by an alpha, who scars or brands the tribe members for identification by other tribes. 
This marks smaller tribes as easy targets for enslavement or annihilation by more dominant tribes. Pogwampis are mostly scavengers, but they also set malicious traps for unsuspecting prey. They have strong stomachs and can eat poisoned or rotting meat without falling ill. They also have a strong attraction to shiny objects and bury them in various locations around their lairs, marking each spot with their urine, which has a potent and persistent odor. The smell not only identifies the location of the stash, but also lingers on the objects themselves, much to the dismay of adventurers who happen upon this hidden loot. Vexgits. Vexgits are a type of gremlin that live primarily in urban environments and are known for their insatiable desire to dismantle and transform complex technology into deadly traps. These creatures have a unique exoskeleton made of semi-pliable chitin that they must shed periodically when they grow or reproduce. During this time, they are vulnerable until their new shell hardens. Vexgits can survive for long periods without food or water, and they typically scavenge or steal from larger creatures to survive. These alien cockroach-like creatures prefer to live in hidden places like abandoned buildings, walls, cellars, or rafters, where they collect and hoard various pieces of disassembled devices. Although they collect and hoard items, they don't much care about treasure and leave it scattered among their piles of junk. The Norns Similar to the three fates of Greek, Roman, or Slavic origin, the Norns of Norse mythology are female entities who control the destinies of both mortals and immortals. While there are many Norns described in Norse myth who serve different purposes, the most powerful and prominent were known as Urthur, Verthandi, and Skald. These giantesses were said to have ended the gods' golden age with their arrival at the Well of Fate, and they were thereafter tasked with pouring water and sand over Yggdrasil, the world tree, so that its branches would remain intact, thereby safeguarding the fate of all who exist. Although all Pathfinder Fae are considered strange and cryptic to the mortal-born denizens of the material world, scholars believe that Norns are the most mysterious of all Fae kind, and their incredible power and prescience seems to be rooted in the very fabric and texture of the First World itself. When facing a triumvirate of towering, august Norns, adventurers may feel small and insignificant. These impossibly tall Fae are detached from mundane concerns and exist to deliver prophecies, test heroes, and preserve the destiny of all life in the multiverse. With a height of over 14 feet and a weight of 800 pounds, Norns are physically imposing Fae creatures. They wear their hair in complex array of braids that reach nearly to their feet, and their skin comes in all shades. As they age, their skins and eyes lighten, and their hair gradually turns blonde. Their eyes can be azure, violet, or amber, and take on an otherworldly glow, especially when the creatures are searching for magical auras. When on Galarian, Norns typically wear luxurious flowing furs that cover most of their bodies. Their rich, authoritative voices boom in unison when they speak, causing all who hear to take notice of their words. Norns often appear on Galarian during times of great turmoil, or just prior to major events, earning them much more reverence among the few who know they exist. Some adventurers believe Norns are simply overhyped giants, and Norns do not sway opinions on the matter. The Varki are known to worship Norns as all-powerful protectors, but the Norns themselves do not answer misguided prayers. Instead, they concern themselves with matters important to their self-styled purpose, that is, keeping the multiverse from slipping into chaotic oblivion. Although Norns appear immortal on the First World, they do age on Galarian, but at a decelerated rate, and begin to experience confusion, a loss of physical strength, and a serious impairment of their abilities after spending more than three centuries there. To combat this, Norns always travel in threes, which allows them to retain their powers and prevent age-related degradation more effectively. Contrary to rumors, a Norn triumvirate is not one soul split into three creatures, but rather three individual Norns, who are physically, mentally, and emotionally attuned, an arrangement not unlike a hag coven. Unlike most Fae, Norns are not born biologically and do not procreate sexually. They were born in threes during a time before history via a method of reproduction they no longer possess. Fortunately, though new Norns cannot be created, when a Norn dies on the material plane, they are reborn as infants on their native plane. Typically, they must grow to maturity before seeking out their previous companions, to whom they are bound across all their lives. Norns who have lost or expelled a group member typically seek their reborn companion in the first world, or wait on Galarian for their new, matured group member to rejoin their ranks. Norns require food, drink, and sleep, despite their celestial appearance, and their enormous size means they have ravenous appetites. They prefer meat to grains and vegetables, and are skilled at hunting with their wicked shears. Scholars have extracted certain facts about Norn's creation and the role in the multiverse from myths repeated by northern peoples of Galarian. It is said Norns came into existence before the gods abandoned the first world, and in those early days they considered themselves caretakers of all creation. 
However, the gods abandoned the first world, causing a traumatic event Norns refer to as the Severing, which made them believe they had failed in their mission. After the rise of the Eldest, Norns have sought to atone for their previous failure. Despite the age of lost omens, Norn's prophecies have remained eerily accurate, leading some to believe the creature's ultimate role in the cosmos is even larger than scholars imagine. While most Norn triumvirates work to ensure the gears of fate keep turning, some serve individual eldest, leading to more confusion about how Norn's missions fit into the larger lines of fate. Norns don't interact with others of their kind unless their missions require such alliances. They tend to view all creatures equally as keys to fate's designs, with the exception for humans, whom they believe are capable of great foreordained deeds. Therefore, Norns pay close attention to humans, particularly adventurers who show potential to affect widespread change. Norns are willing to ally with other powerful goodly creatures when it becomes necessary to accomplish a particularly important goal. Although Norns as powerful fey creatures have means of entering the world anywhere on Galarian, they are rarely seen in most parts of the world, appearing randomly and only as their esoteric missions push them to do so. The only exception to this rule is around the Grungir forest in the Linorm kingdoms. Here the veil vale proves particularly thin, and Norns frequently shepherd groups of animals from the first world to the lands of the Linorm kings, which has led to sightings of both the Norns and of other strange fey creatures in and around the forest. Nymphs Nymphs stem from Greek mythology, where they were described as nature spirits that would take the form of beautiful women. In Pathfinder, nymphs are an all-female species that bond with a natural place, such as a particularly majestic tree, or any unspoiled natural wonder, like a natural cave, or a water feature like a lake, waterfall, or river, or even a glade or natural woodland clearing. This place is generally referred to as a nymph's ward, and because they tend to pick particularly beautiful natural locations to protect, nymphs can always be found living in remote and stunning locations across the world. These dangerous yet alluring beings are considered some of the least capricious of all fey, yet their behavior remains as unpredictable as the wilds they inhabit. Nymphs appear as breathtakingly beautiful young women with almond-shaped eyes ranging from deep cerulean to pale emerald. Their skin and hair color match the local human population, and they possess long tapered ears similar to those of elves. Some nymphs favor clothing made from the materials of their bonded environments, such as berry hats, leaf gowns, and branch boots, while others sometimes wear no clothing at all. Most humanoid races consider nymphs to be the epitome of physical beauty, particularly humans who view them as idealized versions of themselves. However, their beauty is so powerful that few creatures can gaze upon them without being affected. If a nymph is not careful to adjust herself to a more welcoming form, merely seeing a nymph's perfect form can cause blindness, and even a sideways glance can leave a creature stunned into submission. Rumors abound that an embrace from a nymph can cause madness, provided the recipient survives. Due to their stunning beauty, other races tend to fear and respect nymphs, and rarely disturb them. However, some are tempted to seek out these fey in pursuit of perfection. Such individuals may find themselves wandering blindly through the woods forever marked by the image of the nymph. Nevertheless, for those who show respect, nymphs can be kind and gentle creatures, often showering well-intentioned visitors with magical gifts and inspiring them to greatness. Nymphs inhabit untouched natural environments of various kinds, from mountains to rainforests, which they fiercely protect against any who threaten them. They can be hospitable to respectful visitors who seek out their homes for peaceful reasons, and may even offer assistance. Nymphs subsist on whatever food is readily available in their respective environments, and they tend to be vegetarian, even going so far as to avoid eating essential plant parts. They do not understand the concept of marriage or other forms of pair-bond partnerships, only taking lovers for pleasure, and when they do so, preferring passionate but short-lived affairs. Nymphs typically live between 300 and 500 years in the material plane, but their lifespans can increase to several millennia on the first world. Nymphs interact with non-fey in one of two ways, as mysterious and helpful beauties, or as fierce protectors with a vendetta against those who harm their homes. If an outsider innocently stumbles upon a nymph's ward, she is typically kind and quickly ushers the guest away, offering assistance if needed. However, if someone comes to take advantage of a nymph for her home, they will face a fierce guardian. Solitary nymphs can be encountered throughout the inner sea region, in any area of great natural beauty. Some famous nymphs include Calirai, the Ivory Queen, one of the most powerful nymphs of the Mwangi Expanse, whose ward is a vast elephant graveyard. The Lady of the Lotus, who dwells on the coast of Jalmeray and protects a beach of perfect marble sand. The Wasted Maiden, a corrupted nymph who resides in the Mana Wastes, where the warped magic of the region prolonged her existence. And Intindyatra, a nymph who lives in the glittering chasm in the Winterwall Glacier that sparkles like diamonds when the sunlight filters through its thin roof. 
In the first world, nymphs are frequently in positions of power and serve as intermediaries between the capricious and unpredictable leaders of the first world, known as the eldest. The Lantern King has the most significant number of nymph followers, followed by Ing and the Lost Prince. Nymphs who are in service to the eldest frequently acquire their qualities and often have powerful abilities beyond the gifts they are naturally born with. Nymphs come in a variety of subspecies, typically varying depending on the nature of their ward. Dryads are the most common nymph subtype. Dryads are a woodland nymph form. While dryads oversee all the woods around them, they are inseparably connected to a specific tree, typically an oak. Dryads who are bonded to other types of trees possess the same fundamental characteristics, but they may differ in appearance and temperament to align with their assigned tree. For instance, cherry tree dryads possess beautiful pink hues and a love of beautiful things. Dryads serve as guardians of the trees and inhabitants of wooded areas in the realm of the Fae. They prefer using subtle means to deter those who may harm their sacred groves and beloved forests. However, if words alone cannot discourage evil threats, they resort to enchantment to gain the support of allies. During peaceful times, dryads lead solitary lives, and communities living in harmony with nature may not even realize the presence of a dryad nearby. The Hesperids are a group of nymphs whose domain is the sunset, serving as protectors of the vibrant golden hues that accompany the setting sun. They reside in remote islands, secluded coastal cliffs and concealed valleys, all locations where the sunset's radiance is at its most impactful. By performing dance-like movements, the Hesperids manipulate the sunlight, enabling them to produce delicate streams of light at close range and searing rays at a distance. Because of their attachment to the splendor of the daily cycle of the sunset, the Hesperids derive a sense of satisfaction from methodical routine which may seem unfamiliar to more untamed and turbulent fae. The Horas are another group of nymphs whose domain is temporal rather than physical. These rare nymphs construct simple astronomical calendars near their dwellings, which they utilize to mark the precise moment when the sun reaches its highest or lowest point in the sky. Ahura connected to the summer solstice grows in power as the sun climbs to its zenith, while a winter solstice Hora becomes feeble and frail. The inverse is valid for the winter Horai, who are at their strongest in the winter time and weakest during the summer. In contrast, autumn and spring Hora draw their power from the autumnal and vernal equinoxes, with their strength diminishing around the opposite equinox. Lampads are underground or cave-dwelling nymph forms, and they are guardians of concealed and shadowy but still beautiful wards. Their responsibility includes not only shielding the subterranean caverns from potential threats, but also ensuring the safety of well-intentioned individuals from the perils that loom beneath the surface. Lampads derive their name from the magical wisps of light that they frequently carry, which guide the lost to safety while simultaneously luring potential hazards to their doom. Due to their unpredictable nature, it can be challenging to anticipate how lampads will respond, but they rarely exhibit malicious behavior without adequate provocation. Naiads are water nymphs, and they serve as guardians of streams, ponds, springs, and other natural freshwater sources. While most naiads prefer living solitary lives close to their designated bodies of water, these nymphs occasionally gather in groups resembling covens, particularly where river tributaries converge, to perform potent magic and bless the surrounding waters. Due to the more fluid nature of their bonds with their water sources, naiads are more likely to interact with humanoid beings, and they may even visit human settlements from time to time. Unlike other nymphs, naiads sometimes embark an adventure, particularly when malevolent forces threaten the nature or the land's well-being. In such situations, they join forces with others to prevent the corruption of the environment. Naiads are sometimes confused and mixed up with the more sinister rusalkas that I'll cover later in this video. Redcaps. Redcaps come from English folklore. In country legend, redcaps, also known as poweries or dunters, are murderous goblins that live in the ruined castles found along the borders between England and Scotland. They are depicted as sturdy old men with red eyes, large teeth, and talons for hands. Redcaps murder travelers who stray into their homes, then use the victim's blood to dye their hats. According to legend, if such a hat ever dries, the redcap wearing it will perish. In Pathfinder, redcaps are one of the most feared types of fae, due to their natural inclination towards cruelty, murder, and torture. They possess a proficiency in the latter, which is enhanced by their innate sense of sadism. The practice of wearing hats soaked in their victim's blood has given them their name and has haunted the nightmares of many. The sound of their iron boots is enough to unsettle even the most seasoned soldiers. While some believe them to be mere figments of the imagination, those who have encountered them can attest to their bloodlust. Redcaps are often mistaken for dirty skinny dwarves standing about three and a half feet tall. Their bodies are lanky and knobby, with bat-like ears and mud-colored skin. They possess powerful corded hands they use to menacingly wave their scythes, which are longer than their bodies. 
Their yellowed beards hang past their belts and are often filled with putrid foodstuffs. Their ghoulish, high-pitched cackling is notorious and can haunt one's mind for a lifetime. Redcaps prefer violence and murder over any other activity, and they avoid speaking to non fey whenever possible. The few words they do utter are often taunts or threats before combat. They enjoy mental torture as much as physical anguish, often toying with their victims before striking. Their favorite practice is to follow their target for miles, clanging their boots and chortling softly while staying just out of sight. The only way to turn them away is to present the holy symbol of a good aligned god, or to fight them and hope for the best. Red caps embody the cruel and sadistic underbelly of nature, much like a wolf's unconscious desire to dismember its prey. To these creatures, death is glorious and messy. Visceral death brought about in close quarters is even better. They are attracted to places that reek of bloody, atrocious death and are uncommonly attuned to a place's history. They can detect the lingering scent of horror and suffering, making historic battlefields, mass graves, abandoned heaps, cave complexes, and old mines their common habitats. Redcaps are known for their small, well-concealed lairs, even when a dozen or more of the creatures live together. These crude dwellings are often decorated with gruesome trophies, including jewelry made from severed fingers and garlands of dried intestines and eyeballs. The stench of these hideouts can be detected from over a mile away by those with keen senses. While redcaps soak their hats and bodies in the blood of their victims, they do not consume the blood for sustenance. Rather, they prefer to eat the organs and bones of their prey, using the blood more for ritualistic purposes. Redcaps see any use of blood beyond soaking their hats as a waste of the precious resource, and they actively seek out opportunities to spill more blood and increase their supply. Although most mistake all redcaps for males, the species is evenly split between genders. To the discerning eye, female redcaps are distinguishable by their shorter, patchier beards, hairless hands, and slimmer body frames. Both male and female redcaps share the exact same penchant for violence and brutality. It's believed that redcaps only reproduce after successful murders, engaging in ecstatic and ritualistic acts. The distinctive beards of redcaps grow as early as childhood, and they use this wool-like undercoat that hangs from their chins to knit their hats. Redcaps have easy access to their own neck wool, enabling them to create new caps quickly if needed. However, most redcaps feel exposed and vulnerable without their hats, and keep their original caps as a gruesome reminder of every murder they have committed since birth. Redcaps can live up to 60 years in the material plane, but it is unlikely for them to reach the end of their natural lifespan as they prefer to live lives with bloody dangerous conflict rather than peaceful and quiet ones. Redcaps are commonly found in Varicia, particularly in the wilds, where they have an ample supply of native victims. The Hollow Mountain, with its dreadful caverns filled with the ghosts of Thessalonian worker slaves, is an attractive location for redcaps. The Lost Coast, with its goblin-filled forests and other strange beastly fae, also harbors redcaps. Other areas of Varicia that are said to have redcap enclaves include the Iron Peaks, the Stony Mountains, and the Sanos Forest. Nidal and Isker are also attractive habitats for redcaps, due to their years of bloodshed and miles of wild hills and forests. In Nidal, redcaps roam freely in the Uskwood and the massive Cairn Necropolis of the Barrow Moor. In Isker, they inhabit the Chitterwood's countless warrens and caverns, and some have even allied with the recovering goblinoid population. Finder's Gulch is another place where redcaps are said to inhabit, but their ability to coexist with the Ilkaina Alnor's undead hordes is still up for debate. Both the northern and southern Fangwood are known to be home to a gang of rogue redcaps, who prey on the forest's isolated orc tribes and human rangers. They are also known to live in relative peace in Kionin, alongside large populations of other fae. In the River Kingdoms, redcaps delight in terrorizing the brigands and outcasts who call the chaotic county's rivers and forests their homes. Rusalkas Rusalkas come from Slavic mythology originally, and the word rusalka appears to be linked to water and riverbed. These creatures lived in the seas, streams, and lakes, sometimes in magnificent palaces made of gold and silver. Depending on their origin, some rusalkas had different dispositions and either wanted to charm humans or kill them. Rusalkas were also closely associated with linen and would accept it as an offering. According to this folklore, any who walked on the fae's linen while it was still drying would be cursed by them. In Pathfinder, Rusalkas are a fey creature type, ecologically similar to nymphs, but where nymphs are connected to any place of natural splendor, Rusalkas are like naiads and are always connected to a water feature of some kind, like a stream, river, or lake, and typically colder waters than those favored by naiads. However, the real way in which they are different from nymphs and naiads is in their temperament. Perhaps as a result of dwelling in chilling waters all their lives, Rusalkas are typically spiteful and sadistic in nature, very different from their naiad and nymph cousins. Rusalkas have the appearance of drowned young women, with pale, water-soaked skin and tangled hair that seems to float even when they're not in water. Most Rusalkas don't bother with clothing, but some wear flowing white gowns, usually taken from a drowned victim, sometimes to better impersonate the ghosts of those same victims. 
This trick is meant to lure victims closer to charm and bring the unsuspected prey under the Rusalka's influence. Rusalkas may keep captives for their own amusement and discard them when they become bored. However, these crafty fae will use charmed non-fae to spread misinformation if news of their true nature gets out. After all, hunters with holy water are preferred to those armed with cold iron. Rusalkas are covetous creatures who prefer to receive gifts rather than simply stealing them from victims. Given a choice, a Rusalka would rather have a prize obtained through deceit than one granted knowingly. Hence, pretending to be ghosts, Rusalkas often plant the false notion in their victims that their restless spirits can be appeased with offerings. In regions where people are familiar with the Rusalka's true nature, villagers often develop a precarious relationship with the creature. They provide it with linen, wreaths, and shiny objects every year in exchange for being allowed to live in peace. Rusalkas typically accept these gifts, but if some of a village's young people go missing, few villagers can afford to speak out against the reneging fae. To avoid losing any of their own to the charms of a Rusalka, some towns direct adventures to the streams or pools where these creatures live, hoping to either offer the fae more interesting prey or get rid of them once and for all. Rusalkas hold a great respect for music that borders on the religious. This is because Rusalkas are not born in the traditional way, but from a combination of water, earth, and song. Births of Rusalka are rare, as these creatures are solitary and possessive by nature. The mother Rusalka spends half a week above water, molding a portion of mud from the edge of her pond or stream into the shape of a swaddled child, while singing songs she has heard throughout her life. The mother Rusalka then dives under the water, nestling the mud shape in the pond or stream bed, imbuing her offspring with a connection to both the water and fey magic over the remainder of the week. At the end of the week, she pulls the sculpture out of the ground, revealing one or more living, breathing daughters. A newborn Rusalka grows quickly, reaching the size of an eight-year-old humanoid girl just after a month of meals of fish, water flora, and her mother's milk. Growth slows significantly after this point, and by the end of the first year, the young Rusalka is sent away from her mother's territory. Over the next 40 years, she grows into an adult Rusalka. When a Rusalka arrives on the material plane, or seeks to relocate, she usually encounters hostility from the locals whose territory she invades. To fend off potential rivals, Rusalkas keep pets under their control, but they trade up if they come across more attractive thralls. While some Rusalkas prefer powerful magical beasts, most of them prefer humanoids and seek to acquire strong warriors capable of combat. Once settled, they focus on their own interests and prefer pets who are skilled with instruments and can provide accompaniment to their singing and dancing. They often attempt to ensnare bards first, but will not hesitate to kill them if necessary. Rusalkas are proud of their singing, and may be tempted to engage in a dangerous game of challenge and response with other skilled performers. Although Rusalkas can be spiteful and vindictive, like most fey, they feel a special kinship with the natural world, and they do help maintain the balance of nature, and prevent other races from destroying the lands around them. Rusalkas see themselves as nature's first defense against humanity, and believe that civilized races can only be taught through force and guile. They are concerned with themselves primarily, but if they perceive a violation of nature, especially in the waterway in which they live, they show no mercy. While Rusalkas can live in any body of water, they prefer colder climates, such as those found in northern Avistan, especially Irisan, where they often oppose the ruling white witches. Although Rusalkas are not known for their kindness, some of them may act as guardians of particular villages against outside threats, perhaps because they realize that the dead are poor tribute givers. Satyr Satyrs also come to us from Greek mythology, where they were initially devotees of Silenus, a lesser god of fertility. They were depicted as beings with the upper bodies of men and the lower bodies of goats. Satyrs were also connected to the famous Greek deity Dionysus, who was known as the god of wine, wild frenzy, and euphoria. And indeed, throughout history, satyrs have always been linked to music, revelry, and indulgence. Romans expanded upon the satyr idea in various ways, including adding the creature's unique horns and highlighting the satyr's subversive nature on stage. As a result, the Roman version of satyrs were not merely used for comedic purposes, but were employed to create sharp social commentaries, giving rise to the term satire. In Pathfinder, the infamous satyrs are a well-known fey race. Their bodies combine human torsos with strong, cloven-hoofed goat legs. They have rugged faces adorned with large ram horns and unkempt fur, emitting earthy smells. Although not conventionally handsome, they have a reputation as seducers with insatiable carnal desires. Satyrs are associated with wild drinking, feasting, and sexual activities, and their seductive powers are legendary. Despite being known for their carnal pursuits, satyrs are also recognized for their innate musical and magical talents. They use their panpipes to cast spells that can influence creatures in different ways. Although some older satyrs possess a wide range of magical abilities, most limit themselves to melodies that can prevent combat or ingratiate them with strangers. 
Despite being possessed of various fey powers, they do not rely on magic to aid their amorous pursuits, preferring instead to trust in their natural charms and wit. Their confidence and attentive wooing are irresistible to many, while others are attracted to their carefree lifestyle and libertine ways. Unfortunately, satyrs are not interested in lasting relationships and are quickly lured away by the next conquest. Satyrs are often the subjects of ribald jokes and raunchy songs throughout Galarian. However, despite the common misconceptions, satyrs share many similarities with other humanoids. They stand a little over six feet tall on average and are lean and muscular. They require the same amount of food and sleep as humans, although their penchant for excess often leads them to overindulge in both. To satisfy those appetites, satyrs spend much of their time foraging for food in fey forests or looking for hospitable hosts with well-stocked pantries. Although largely vegetarian, satyrs are not averse to meat and sometimes lure prey with their magical compulsions. They prefer low-hanging fruit and see too much effort spent on sustenance as a distraction from the pleasures of life. The opposite of dryads, nymphs, and rusalkas, satyrs are instead an exclusively male species, and unlike the all-female fey of the first world that I've covered, satyrs have no means of reproducing as a species asexually. Instead, like hags or harpies, they must seek out potential mates from among other species. Though they have a strong preference for dryads and nymphs, on account of the fey connection and similar capricious nature, satyrs' innate magical nature means they can mate with a wide variety of humanoids and fey. When they do so, the offspring is always a satyr. Because the parentage of satyr children is absolutely indisputable, those newborns often suffer the rage of cuckolded spouses or the shame of their indiscreet mother. Sometimes, abandoned satyr infants are discovered and raised by sympathetic fae until they are old enough to join a community of their own kind. Fae creatures are renowned for being secretive and preferring to remain secluded in the wilderness of Galarian. While many of these creatures avoid contact with humanoids, others are more open to interaction with them. Satyrs, known for their insatiable desires, naturally fall into the latter category. This sociability, coupled with their well-known philandering, makes them widely recognized throughout Galarian. Satyrs are dispersed across the land due to their itinerant lifestyle and tendency to leave after accomplishing their seductions. While there is no centralized satyr culture on Galarian, they are well known and accepted in fey enclaves throughout the inner sea region. The majority of satyrs are located in central Avistan, but they have also been sighted as far east as western Kazmarin and as far south as central Garand. Human populations hold conflicting opinions regarding satyrs. On the one hand, they embody what many wish they could be, carefree, joyful, and liberated. On the other hand, they also epitomize what many people see as barbarism, rampant promiscuity, squalor, and sloth. While some hold one or the other opinion, the vast majority regard satyrs with some combination of fascination and loathing. The Talden nobility has a fetishistic attraction to satyrs, and rumors of a Talden noblewoman being lured into the Verduran forest by a satyr will often create a scandal that can launch the lady into the social spotlight. Not all nations' inhabitants, however, are as captivated by satyrs as the Taldans. The Chelish, for example, have hunted satyrs to near extinction within their borders to obtain the satyr's horns, which they sell to wealthy diabolists. These buyers mistakenly believe that ingesting or making items from the satyr's horns will bestow upon them a measure of the fae's legendary virility. While most cultures view satyrs as disreputable, ethnic Varisians have a definite cultural affinity for the sylvan creatures. These nomads see something of themselves in the satyrs, who share their love of music, wine, and wandering. Both are also victims of misconceptions and dubious reputations. Though the two groups do not necessarily seek each other out, there is a tacit respect between them. This makes Varicia, and the Sanos Forest in particular, a traditional safe haven for this kind of fae. Sprites Throughout folk tales around the world, there is a persistent belief in the existence of diminutive spiritual creatures. These creatures are often referred to as sprites, a term derived from the Latin word spiritus, meaning spirit. In European folklore, sprites are depicted as human-like creatures, roughly the size of large insects, with bodies that display dazzling colors and glistening membranous wings. They are considered the most common type of fairy, and reside in forests with high populations of other fae. Sprites are known to be playful, mischievous, and easily distracted. They hold a deep reverence for nature, which is reflected in their diet, consisting of insects that harm the plants they cherish. Galarian's enigmatic sprites are perhaps the most misunderstood of all the creatures of the fae realm. They possess an alluring beauty, yet remain primitive in nature, and are both solitary and ruthlessly competitive. Despite their martial prowess, sprites are drawn to magic and wonders of the world, and while they fiercely protect nature, they also love to decorate their treetop homes with man-made trinkets. These complex personalities result in sprites being regarded as both champions of nature and pesky nuisances. Regardless, adventurers are well aware of the dangers that lurk within the wooded homes of these fae. 
At only nine inches tall and weighing a mere pound or two, sprites are among the smallest of the fey. Their feathery wings boast a unique color, ranging from brilliant orange to deep emerald to rich violet. Sporting long elf-like ears and lithe athletic builds with fiery hair, sprites' naturally luminous bodies glow in varying colors and intensities at will. Proud of their flamboyance, sprites adorn themselves with intricate tattoos that hold great significance, with competitions being held to determine the most beautiful body art. Sprites are innately curious, but they are distrustful of outsiders, even other fey, leading them to perceive most intruders as threats. This stems from their small size, which makes them easy prey. To protect themselves, sprites wield short swords and short bows, fleeing when outmatched, but taking risks for valuable treasure or adventures. They are at their fiercest when their forest homes are threatened, defending their sanctuaries with an unrelenting determination. Many adventurers have learned the hard way about the dangers of stumbling upon a tiny treetop village and its winged inhabitants. Sprites are social creatures, rarely found alone, and instead living in tribes that can consist of anywhere from 40 to several thousand individuals. They make their homes in high forest canopies, using expertly carved tree trunks and thick branches as their dwellings, and a system of vine bridges and lifts to maintain a tight-knit community. Although not particularly skilled in magic, sprites are captivated by the concept and find ruined temples or crumbling spires particularly intriguing. They may even adopt and protect these features as part of nature. Due to their interest in magic, sprites are unusually receptive to taking on roles as familiars. As protectors of nature, sprites view the earth as the answer to all their needs and consume fungi and harmful insects. They can fashion a wide variety of items from the natural world to suit their needs, and they take pride in their flamboyant appearance often using natural dyes to create intricate tattoos that hold great meaning. Sprites participate in elaborate mating rituals each year, with potential suitors spending the winter determining how to impress their potential mates. When spring arrives, the dusky forests light up with their wooing efforts, which include pulsing displays of color, aerial maneuvers, and fierce competitions to prove who is fastest and brightest. When a courted sprite finds these efforts satisfactory, she signals her desire by placing a flowery wreath on the head of her chosen suitor. Although a mated pair of sprites might produce one or two offspring, most sprite couplings endure for only a few seasons before they part ways. Despite their skill at survival, sprites are not particularly long-lived creatures, living 40 years or less on the material plane. They reach adolescence by their fifth year and adulthood by their tenth, and they are acutely aware of their mortality. This may explain why they constantly feel the need to seize the day, no matter the ramifications. The tribes of sprites in Galarian consist of those who have recently migrated from the First World and those who have been here for generations. Despite the difference in their length of stay, sprites generally have similar abilities and personality traits. While many sprite habitats have been documented, there are still undiscovered locations where they exist. The jungles of the Mwangi Expanse provide a natural habitat for sprites due to their undisturbed forests, ancient magic, and thick canopy. In the heart of the jungle, there is a thriving sprite metropolis called Alavellium, which is home to hundreds of tribes, consisting of thousands of individual sprites. This fey city is possibly the largest concentration of fey on the material plane, due to the sheer number of diminutive sprites that can fit in the space. The Mwangi natives who live nearby avoid Alavellium because of the overwhelming number of sprites. In other parts of Garand, sprites are feared for different reasons. Inhabitants of Geb avoid the malevolent sprites in the nation's haunted woodlands, which have an unhealthy interest in necromancy and a love of cruelty. These Gebite sprites have pale ghostly glows, macabre body paintings, and decorations made of the bones of small woodland creatures. Instead of celebrating joy, these evil fey sing somber dirges and dance like puppets. In Avistan, sprites have been documented in the woodlands around Lake Incarthen especially Rasmiran's Exalted Wood, where they are hunted by priests of Rasmir, Kionin's Firani Forest, where isolationism keeps them safe, and near Mathis's Fangwood, where a mysterious blight affects the sprite tribes. Travelers through the Verduran Forest and Taldor have reported encountering sprites, but their presence is denied by the gnomes of Wispil, and few have found their hidden homes. Unicorns Although most of the fey types I focused on in this video are roughly humanoid in shape and appearance, the first world was a testing ground for the gods, and all manner of creatures were given form there first before they were finalized into the current designs we see on the material world. As a result, fey creatures are not limited to humanoid types, but can have all sorts of animalistic forms. Also, unlike the animals of the material plane, some of these creatures have sophisticated intellects and complex societies. Perhaps no fey animal creature is more iconic than the unicorn. The noble and intelligent creature known as the unicorn fiercely defends its woodland homes. These majestic creatures resemble magnificent white horses, sometimes with a goat-like beard, but always with a long ivory horn protruding from their foreheads. Typically, a unicorn is 8 feet long, 5 feet tall at the shoulder, and weighs 1,200 pounds. 
Despite looking like an animal in the eyes of a humanoid, they have human-like intelligence, and can even speak using language, which it emits through vibrations of its horn rather than vocalized through the mouth. While unicorns are often solitary creatures, a mated pair can be found together as unicorns mate for life. Occasionally, unicorns will travel in groups. A group of unicorns is typically referred to as a blessing of unicorns. But they rarely number more than six altogether, as unicorns are uncomfortable in larger groups. They are an inherently good-aligned species, and most unicorns are the implacable foes of evil and do not tolerate destructive creatures in their territory. They prefer to associate only with other good-aligned fae, good-aligned humanoids or animals. Their natural empathy enables them to befriend the animals of their environment, and they can ally with other good creatures in times of need. When they do associate with humanoids, they prefer the company of female to male humanoids, and this is the case regardless of the gender of the unicorn. In rare cases, a unicorn may become the companion and protector of a virtuous human woman, particularly as the steed of virtuous female knights. However, these relationships usually end if the woman commits to a lover or a child, leading to the false myth that unicorns only associate with virgins. Unicorns are strong and hardy creatures that can physically overcome their foes using their hooves and sharp horns. They prefer to charge their enemies to take full advantage of their horns, which can harm creatures that are resistant to anything but magic weapons or celestial attacks. The unicorn's horns, also known as alicorns, have magical properties that enable them to detect and protect themselves from evil and to heal creatures with their touch. Unicorn horns can also be used as a component in magical healing, and powdered unicorn horn is highly valued by those who have no qualms about how it was obtained. Some notable examples of unicorns living in the material plane on Galarian include the blighted Axon Wood in Geb, which is home to a unique race of twilight unicorns, the forests of northwestern Sarkoris, which once contained the largest herd of unicorns on Galarian. However, after the opening of the World Wound, nearly all the woodland was burnt to the ground, and its unicorn inhabitants perished in the blaze or were later hunted and killed by demons. This area is now known as the Shroud of Unicorns. Finally, it is said that the stuffed head of an otherwise unknown black unicorn also decorates the trophy room of Assyrian's ruler, the Ruby Prince. Thank you so much for watching. If there are other creatures you'd like me to cover in my creature feature series, please let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.